Well, you know, we, we know that the industry has a lot of questions. So we, what we decided to start off with for this talk is an explanation from our, our own team, uh, Professor Matthew Daly, and he is also the director of AI Center at AIT here. And he was gonna just give us the brief overview, what are the potentials of AI? So you can take a look of the history and what it can possibly do for you and your business and even apply to any other industry that you're interested in. So welcome, Professor Matthew. So thank you very much uh, to Tina, and uh, it's uh, my pleasure to be here today and represent uh, AIT and the uh, AIT AI Center. Okay, so uh, so I've got a presentation uh, that uh, we're we're queuing up. Okay, so while I'm waiting for the presentation, uh, so um, I'll tell a little bit about myself. So I'm a computer scientist. I started out uh, in the United States. Uh, I, I spent some time in industry, uh, working in the robotics industry before coming to Thailand and joining uh, a, a couple academic institutes before coming to AIT. And I've been here at AIT for about 15 years now, uh, working in this, in this area of artificial intelligence. So, um, so I'm really happy to have a chance to share my knowledge and expertise and also interact with members of the community, especially in the in the enterprises and, and find out what are the problems that uh, you face in your businesses and then how can we uh, at AIT help to to make that more uh, to to make your business flows more efficient. Okay, so we're ready. So anyway, um, so yeah, this is Matthew Daly and I'm from currently the director of the AI Center at AIT. Okay. So the first thing that I'm going to do is tell you a, a short story. It'll just take a few minutes. And uh, if you haven't heard this story, it's uh, kind of an interesting one. Uh, so, so I'm going to tell you about some curious scientists, uh, this uh, military industrial complex and its uh, seeking of greater glory, and then uh, a, a, a tricky problem in, in technology that was cracked only in the last 10 years. OK. Yeah. So the. So the origins of AI, they really started out in 1956 uh, at, uh, at Dartmouth College. So it was, uh, it was basically a summer project by a bunch of uh, ac very academic professors who were curious to find out, could we actually create software programs and machines that could mimic human intelligence, okay? So, so this, uh, this, this uh, endeavor, it, as I said, it started out as a summer project and then it turned into an entire industry. Okay, so shortly after 1956, and for quite some time, there was a lot of interest in artificial intelligence. And at the time, uh, anybody who was alive at that time knows that uh, in, the, in the public imagination, things like robots and, uh, and, and, and machine intelligence and things like that were quite uh, provocative. And, and a lot of people were, were really interested in, in, the, in the possibilities. And so during this time, there were massive investments in artificial intelligence technologies um, especially in the United States and in the United Kingdom, okay? So during that time, a lot of really interesting problems were solved, such as, uh, you know, automatic playing of checkers, uh, also like logical theorem proving, uh, and many advances were made during this time. However, the, probably the, the most important thing that the, the people putting the money into artificial intelligence at that time wanted, and I wonder if anybody can guess what that was? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Military applications, and in particular, what they what what people thought they might get out of uh, artificial intelligence very early on was machine translation, especially from Russian to English. Right. So this was the this was the height of the Cold War, of course. Right. And, and this was this was high on uh, people's minds. So it turned out, though, however, that uh, the the basic uh, the problems that people were working on at that time. Um, the, the very, uh, very little progress finally was made on the really tough questions such as machine translation. Um, so what happened was that, uh, that finally the governments that were funding the research in these areas realized that, oh, this technology is not going anywhere and it's not going to do anything for us. And so the research funding, especially from the, the military agencies in the United States and Britain, uh, completely collapsed. And so all the, the, the researchers in artificial intelligence then were left 
without any money to, to do their work. And so they're freezing in the cold of winter. Okay. So things started to improve in terms of uh, research interest and funding when actually the Japanese government decided that it was time to invest in AI technologies. So there was this so-called uh, fifth generation computer project in Japan that led to, again, massive, in, massive investments in artificial intelligence technologies, especially into, the, into computer systems, uh, high performance computer systems that could do computation. They were mainly interested in expert systems. And at that time, uh, one, of the, one of the expert systems that proved to be extremely successful was one called Mycin, which was able to prescribe uh, antibiotics hospitals more accurately than doctors could at that time. So this is a, one of the very early successes of artificial intelligence. Okay, so um, during this time, the, there was some quiet progress was made in this, this area called neural networks. And in particular, in 1986, there was a discovery or maybe a rediscovery by, by three uh, researchers at the Institute for Cognitive Science at the University of California at San Diego. These were the researchers who discovered the, the algorithm that has led to all of the success in modern AI called backpropagation. So these were, the, these were the researchers that figured out how to make complex deep neural networks learn. Okay, however, uh, also during that time, there was another wave of dissatisfaction with uh, the, 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 the way that the field was going, that uh, all this investment in expert systems turned out not to be paying off very well. Systems tended to be very brittle and, uh, and, and difficult to, to, uh, to, to get anything out of. So again, the, first the government funding in the 1970s collapsed, and then the industrial funding in the 1980s also collapsed, right, leading to what they call the second AI winter. However, during that time, there was quiet progress in neural network research, and that went on for time. Okay, another, some other things that happened during that time were advances in some, very, some, some, some areas that turned out to be quite, uh, quite useful and some others that are, are maybe less useful. Uh, so, for example, during this time in the 1990s, the problem of speech recognition was essentially solved, right? Uh, so the, 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 new, the new approach that enabled us to solve problems such as speech recognition were in the area of what we call statistical machine learning, where we use large data sets in order to build systems that can basically mimic what we see in the data set and then uh, apply that to new, um, to, to, to new data sets right, in, in the future. At the same time, uh, IBM's Deep Blue beat Gary Kasparov uh, in chess. And uh, actually a little known, but actually a very important development was the, was the, the DART program, um, which was a, a project of the, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency in the United States. So DART during the, 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 the Gulf War, the first Gulf War, actually saved the military in terms of logistics more money than it ever put into artificial intelligence research over the previous uh, 30 years, okay? So, so it's at this time, not until the 1990s and 2000s that artificial intelligence research was actually starting to pay off and generate real applications that had real impact. Okay. Um, okay. So, the, 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 the modern era of artificial intelligence begins in about 2012, okay? So this is when, uh, for the very first time, a so-called convolutional neural network uh, was successful at beating, uh, at winning the, this, this large-scale image net competition. Um, in, in, it's an academic competition, however, proved to be extraordinarily important in the development of AI technologies specifically that are relevant uh, to, to enterprises, right? So it was at this time that we, we finally started to crack these really difficult problems such as image recognition, um, image understanding, and uh, you know, uh, make, making speech recognition more, uh, you know, more accurate and, and things like that. So all of this is based on the principles of deep learning, which as I said, were actually uh, uncovered back in 1986 by the same researcher, uh, this is uh, Professor Hinton in the middle here, who, uh, who was one of the three co-winners of the Turing Prize just, uh, just two years ago, okay? So all that research uh, from, from the 1980s until today finally culminated in real practical systems that can learn from data in order to solve real world problems. Okay, so let's take a look at what's gonna happen uh, in the future. 
Okay, so as we know, um, we'll, we'll talk a bit about the current uh, promise of AI technologies. So they're already creating great opportunities for the companies that are actually ready and able to adopt AI technologies right now. Okay, so what's, what's happening in the near term is that we're going to see the combination of a few different uh, trends. In particular, the synthesis of data, you know, very large data sets along with machine learning algorithms, and then integration of logic and reasoning with uh, exi our existing capabilities. So these are going to lead to new successes uh, in, in, the, in the area of AI in the short term. In the, in the medium term, there are even geopolitical consequences of, of artificial intelligence, right? We don't know who's going to win this race. Uh, is it going to be the United States? Is it going to be China? Um, and so actually the, the future of the world, in some sense, depends on uh, uh, artificial intelligence research in some, in, in some sense. And uh, then in the longer term, something that we'll maybe talk about this afternoon a little bit is that, uh, of course, you know, you know from, the, from the Hollywood movies and, uh, and, 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 and literature, right, that uh, artificial intelligence poses a grave risk to humanity's own existence as well, right? So anyway, so we'll talk about these issues a little bit later. Okay. All right. So now what we have to worry about in the near term is, the, is what's going to happen in business in the next, actually it's already happening, but in the next 10 years we're going to see a lot of change due to AI technologies, okay? So in particular, the, one of the most important uh, trends that's going to affect business and also society is disruptions to the labor markets, okay? So in, if you take a look at uh, some industries such as banking, right? There's enormous opportunities in banking and finance. The, the, the pundits predict that over a, over a trillion dollars uh, can be saved over the, over the next, uh, the, this coming period, okay? At the same time, so the industry is going to save a lot of money, but at the same time, a lot of jobs are going to be lost, right? Uh, so are we going to recover these jobs? Are we going to move people out of the jobs that they're doing today into, into more uh, productive work? That's a, that's a question that remains to be seen. Okay. Just one simple example. Think about the effect that self-driving vehicles is going to have on the labor market around your own, your own home. Are you still going to have a motorcycle taxi to take you to the, to the, the SkyTrain in the morning? Right? Are you, are you going to have a human uh, taxi driver that takes you across the city? Right? So, so I think you can see that we're going to see a lot of changes in the near future. Okay. So now... So moving away from the global picture, let's move toward the, a, a more regional picture in Southeast Asia and South Asia. Okay, so now these data are not so easy to, to get, right? Uh, and uh, the most up-to-date report that we have is one from 2017 by McKinsey. Okay, so they did an extensive study of the opportunities and challenges for AI adoption within uh, Southeast and, and South Asia. And these are some of the, some of the um, uh, uh, consequences of that of that very large effort of that report. So first of all, is that uh, Southeast Asia is way behind uh, the uh, other regions of the world in terms of AI adoption. Okay, but at the same time, we are going to see the same kind of labor market disruption in this region that that is going to happen in other areas of the world. And depending on which country you're talking about, up to 50% of today's jobs are going to be lost in the next in the, in the coming decade or so. Okay, so there's a really tremendous impact that, uh, that, that these technologies are, are going to have on, on our labor markets and on our businesses. So it means that a lot of businesses that are open today are going to be closed 10 years from now due to artificial intelligence. So this is a bit scary, right? And at the same time, a lot of people that have jobs today are not going to have jobs uh, 10 years from now. So, so that's, the, that's the scary side of the picture. But now, what about the opportunities? So if you look at what's happening uh, today uh, in, in artificial intelligence and in terms of adoption, it's already the case that the companies that are able to adopt technologies in order to improve their business processes are already seeing higher profit margins than those that are not, okay? So if you look at this, uh, look at this graph that I'm, uh, that I'm showing uh, in terms of opportunities in Southeast Asia, so the AI adopters with a proactive AI strategy, these are the ones that are getting much higher uh, profit margins than, than other businesses in the, same, in the same areas of industry. So and you, as you can see, the highest profit margins today, this is in Southeast, uh, Southeast Asia in particular, are in healthcare and financial services. Okay, so these are the industries that are already adopting 
um, AI technologies at a, at a fast rate, okay? So the other, the other industries are not, not seeing this uh, huge uh, increase yet. However, um, uh, it, all, all of this is, is coming soon, right? So you're soon gonna, gonna see uh, a, a bigger and a bigger gap between the enterprises that are able to adopt AI technologies and those that, those that don't. Okay, so now what is driving these changes? What, what does it actually take to become an AI adopter as, as an enterprise? Okay, so these are the four, this is, this is my, own, uh, my, my own belief, the, the four factors that um, are behind today's practical AI systems that are actually winning uh, winning big profit margins for the enterprises. So first is the availability of very large data sets. So from the, from, the, from the days of the 1990s when the first neural networks were being, were being trained until today, we've seen massive increases in the amount of data that's available for the building of these models. And that's had a huge impact in, the, in terms of the accuracy and usefulness of the, of the predictive models that we have available today. Another uh, really important trend is the availability of cheap uh, compute power. Okay, so, so probably uh, some of you already know that there's a big competition in the marketplace to buy GPUs, right? So, uh, so, so GPUs are good for three things. They're good for gaming, they're good for cryptocurrency mining, and they're good for AI. So, so in, in, these three, in these three areas, uh, uh, we have a, a competition to buy up the available compute power. And Companies like NVIDIA are making massive, massive profits by, by supplying hardware to these, uh, uh, to, to these areas. But anyway, so it's a good time to be a, a hardware vendor if you're NVIDIA and uh, not so good for other, uh, for other companies. Anyway, so the, the third trend is the algorithms that are coming out. So due to the massive investment by, by companies like uh, Google, uh, Facebook, um, so the big, the big tech companies, uh, and also, also in Asia as well. Um, so we're seeing massive and, and really rapid improvement in the algorithms that we have for building AI systems, okay? The good news is that by and large, these algorithms are shared in the community in the form of open source software, okay? So when you combine data, the compute power, and open source algorithms, Right. Th th these are the these are the important things that are um, that, that are driving the, the innovation. And then, of course, the, the, the money that's coming uh, from industry is uh, is is really expanding the, the capabilities of these systems. OK, so so now how do we how do we exploit these four trends? What 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 if, if we're a, a new enterprise that's interested in getting involved in AI technologies or we are already at some level of maturity and we're interested in going to the next step? And what, what, do we have to, what do we have to worry about? So this is what AI technology is about for today's enterprises, in my opinion. So it's about leveraging data that's available. So the, the data has to be available, right, for informed decision making, okay? So the, this is uh, an AI system today in a nutshell, okay? So you can see in the, in the, upper, left, in the upper left corner, we have data, okay? And data comes in many forms. So we have the structured data that an enterprise already has in their hands, maybe in their data warehouse, right? Or in their relational databases. We have things like video or images, right? These could be, these could be CCTV cameras or it could be uh, videos posted on social media. It could be any form of uh, video and image uh, data. We have audio data, like people speaking, like I'm speaking today, right? And then we have uh, unstructured textual data, text documents and so on. So all these data now are, are uh, now, you know, if, if you look at, uh, say, 20 years ago, it was very difficult to work with any of these types of data except the structured data in a database. However, today, with modern deep learning systems, we have the ability to analyze and extract useful information from all of these types of data, unstructured text, video, uh, audio, and then, of course, the traditional uh, structured enterprise data. So, so, that, so that stream is what I would call perception. Okay, so we have all this raw data coming into our AI systems. Okay, what the AI system then has to do is it has to turn this raw data into more useful information. Okay, and in AI we have this, uh, it's called the DIKW <laughs> pyramid, right? Uh, from data to information to knowledge to wisdom. Okay, so there's a hierarchy of, uh, of, of levels of sophistication of information that's, that's available uh, to us or, or knowledge. Okay. So the AI system needs to turn the raw data into more useful information at some level, okay? Then 
there are kind of two uh, two different um, two different uh, uh, modalities for interacting uh, with the outside world, and that is with the user, right? So just normal human computer interaction, uh, presenting information that the that the human can use to make informed decisions, and then the uh, action, right? Actually taking action. So if your if your AI agent is embodied in a robot, right, or has uh, control of uh, industrial manipulators, right? So then the then the agent is ready to um, is ready to act in the in the world. Okay. So that leads to when we say that a lot of modern AI is about turning data into information, and then of course making use of that information for for optimal decision making. So that is, means that we have to think about data science. Okay. So data science is this really interesting uh, intersection of three three basic areas: computer science, mathematics, and then the domain science. Whatever is the domain that you're you're particularly interested in. As I said, could be could be finance, could be healthcare, could be transportation, whatever. Right. But the thing is about data science is that we need all three of these capabilities. We need the we need the the the, the, soft, the computer science skills. We need the mathematical skills. People that can put those things together combined with the, the knowledge of the business domain. Okay. So once we get these three magic ingredients put together, then you have what's called a, a data scientist, right? Uh, who can actually help an organization to make informed decisions. Okay. So this is, this is my kind of rubric for looking at how, um, how mature an organization is in terms of how it leverages data for informed decision making, okay? So there are three levels, right? Uh, one would be rule-based, the next is shallow statistical, and then the next is the, the deep learning-based uh, systems, okay? As you can see, the, the, different, uh, the, the different capabilities at these different levels of maturity in terms of what kind of models we're using for prediction and action, okay? Uh, the amount of data that is needed to develop these capabilities, and then the, the kinds of useful information that we're extracting from the, from the raw data. So in the early days of artificial intelligence, like I was saying in the, say in the, 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 second, the second golden era of expert systems and so on, there was a lot of effort placed into manual extraction of useful information from the raw data using human expertise, okay? So we would interview experts, we'd find out what are the rules that they apply in order to make an informed decision from a, from a data set. And then we would try to automate those, those processes. Okay, and that, that works well to, to an extent. But then uh, more powerful systems can be built when you have the systems extracting the useful data from the data sets autonomously. Okay, so, um, so the, the early models, uh, I would call them shallow statistical models, uh, were effective in, in some areas, such as, as I mentioned, speech recognition, right? But then to, to go to more, uh, to, to, to better capabilities, for example, understanding uh, unstructured textual data to a, to a meaningful level, then we have to go to a whole new, uh, whole new level. So this would be the, the deep learning um, approach to these systems. Okay. So, um, so how does an enterprise get started? So really, uh, as, a, as an organization, you want to look at different aspects, externally and internally, okay? So for example, you might focus on some of your, your inefficient internal processes, right? If you could automate them, or if you could make them more efficient than they are today, then you're going to save money, be more agile, and, and, and so on. Okay, so that's one way to approach the problem. The other is to look at your customers, right? And find out what are the, what are the pain points that your customers are finding today? Then how can you address those through the use of uh, automation technology and data analysis? Okay. Okay, so, so the, the, there have been studies of what are, the, what are the successful elements of AI adoption in enterprises. And so there, there are these uh, five, five elements that seem to be important. So first of all, you have to have good use cases, right? So if you're automating something that is uh, useless uh, or, or not important to your organization, then obviously it's not gonna, it's not gonna be effective. Second is a robust data ecosystem. All of the, the, the predictive models or decision-making models that I, that I mentioned before require extensive use of data, okay? So we need, to get, we need to get the data, we need to transform the data, and we need to then make efficient use of, of those data. Um, we need people. We need people that are actually well-versed in the use of data and the implementation of, of data analytics, okay? We need to take those, uh, those analytics and we need to actually integrate them into the workflow or of, the, of the business organization, okay? And then finally, we need a, we, the, the, this is the, the fifth uh, ingredient for success, is uh, an open culture that embodies change, 
Okay, so all these things might be a barrier to adoption of, of AI technology successfully within an organization. Okay, so um, I'm at the end. Uh, so I want to tell you uh, what is the message uh, that I want you to take home, right? I could say some things like uh, transform or be, become irrelevant, or I could say disrupt or be disrupted, okay? But enough of that, right? Uh, so uh, I don't really have, uh, I don't want to speak uh, empty wise words. So what I want to encourage you to do is to get started in your AI transformation if you're not already. Start building a team that has the skills necessary in order to, uh, in order to build those models that we talked about, in order to improve those workflows that we talked about. And if you already have a team, then find out what's the way to make that team better, okay? And if you need help, get help. If you need help, what I want you to remember is to think about AIT, <laughs> okay? So, uh, all right, yeah. So, um, yeah. So that's, uh, that's the, 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 the end of my talk. So I'll just mention very briefly what AIT is doing in this area. So AIT is involved in three, in three areas, education, outreach, and research, okay? In the educational area, we have a new program called Data Science and Artificial Intelligence. This is a master's program that trains people to be these magical, uh, th th these magical data scientists and artificial intelligence engineers that can help to transform your organization. Um, outreach, we have the AI Center at AIT, as Tina already introduced, and we'll talk more about that in the afternoon. Um, so the, the goal of the AI Center is outreach to enterprises, right, in order to join hands and build solutions to real-world problems. Okay, and then finally is the research side. So at AIT, this is actually this area of data science and artificial intelligence and applications, not only in business, but also across different areas of uh, environment, um, energy, uh, healthcare, and so on. This is one of the focuses of this institute, okay? So I'd encourage you to uh, interact with some of the researchers here uh, if, you're, if you're interested in, in the capabilities and possibilities of, uh, of AI and big data. Okay, so that's all for my talk, and then I'll turn it over to Tina again. So thanks for listening, and I hope to interact with you later. Okay, let's give a hand. Thank you, Professor Matthew for a good insight and some brief history. And I think that's important because if we want to understand um, how we can develop AI further and then utilize data science, we should know where it came from, right? So um, I think it's useful for everyone to take a quick look.